In our text for today, particularly in our in our intro it for today, there is a lie in the beginning that actually is the name of today. It's the name of the church year to date. And you'll see it this evening as you come to celebrate uh, and await the coming of our Lord. And I will bring this up every single Sunday as we continue on. This Sunday, the Latin that it's named after is Ad is, is ad Te Lev, uh, Levave. Ad Te Levave. And what that means is for us Lift up our souls. And that is so critically important. And it comes directly from our intro. So if you look in, in the bulletin, you will find those very words. I lift up my soul, my God. And the reason that that is so important is because when we lift up our heads and we lift up our souls, what we're truly doing is that we are acknowledging God. And to be quite honest, we don't do that very often. Definitely not as often as we should. Lifting up our souls, giving, uh, giving thanks, rejoicing. And recently, this Thanksgiving, Something came across my mind that comes across it every once in a while. Why is it that football games and baseball games can be so packed? <coughs> why, why are they so packed? To watch a game, something that doesn't even matter, outside of the Yankees. But we we pile in. We pay for uh, uh, Sports Center, or not Sports Center, ESPN, NFL Network, Major League Baseball. Yes, the Yankee Entertainment uh, Station. All of these we pay money to go and watch them. And when your team does well, the neighbors know it. When they don't do well, your wife knows it, or your husband knows it, and your neighbors probably think a little less of you as well. And my point is this, why is it that, that, that we are so intrigued by a game whose end result is that you carry a pigskin full of air over a certain line. And then, all week we have to hear about how and in which way and what strategy was used for that, per for that person to carry the ball across that goal line. I like football fine, but it infuriates me that we lift up our souls so much for these sports. Nobody comes and no, nobody packs churches in quite as tightly as a football game. <clears throat> Rarely will you ever see fellowship like you will see at a football game. I don't know how many of you have ever been to a professional football game or, or even a professional baseball game, gone to the crawdads. But the truth is, is that there's great fellowship there. People talk to each other, they share a hot dog, whatever it may be. But when it comes to the word of the Lord, we don't pack in. We don't come to hear the word of salvation, something that actually matters. To hear the word of God preached, to have your sins forgiven, something that matters. But we don't pack it in. 
Is it because of it's is it because of entertainment? Are we that self centered that we need to be entertained at all times? Our iPods we can judge yet. So does church so should be more entertaining in order to have hopes to bring people This blessed church is so close to my heart and all of your hearts has been here since has been to the world. The families who are, who are related to, to the ones who signed the charter so deeply close to them never meant for it to be what it should do, and what it has done, is point to Jesus. And when we, are, when, when we were uh, decorating the, uh, the church yesterday, I made this point. We lift up our souls to Christ. But does anyone notice the greenery and the wreath around the chancel. What does that look like to you? Does anyone have a guess? If you were here yesterday, don't guess. The manger. You are absolutely right. You are absolutely right. This is the only church I've ever seen that has it put in such a way that it looks like the stable in which Christ was, was born. And there up is the Star of David. And what does the Star of David do? Points us to Christ. So every time you come to this church on Sunday, you have a visual reminder of the birth of Christ. It might not be entertaining to you. And if it's not entertaining to you, you need to change your priorities. If it's not important to you, you need to change your priorities. There's an old adage that... Well, I've... I've there's a... There's old adage that says most people who do not attend church never care about a pastor until they need one. And that's true. And when do they need one? Funerals? Weddings? Or some sort of crisis? Though they never come to church, when they need a pastor, it's always in a time of crisis. And what, is, and what does a pastor do? He goes. Of course he goes. But when he gets there, what does he do? He does exactly what the Star of David is doing. He points them to Christ in all things, in all sorrow, in all times. It points to Christ. It is my job to make sure that you lift up your soul to God. This is something that we must do. God requires of you that you rejoice in the salvation that He gave to you. And if you are not, that lifts up your soul that I don't know how to help. <laughs> Do you
you constantly read your Bibles? Air of dust on it? Or is it do, by the way? It's when you read Scripture, your soul is lifted up. You are edified. And you recall, the, and every time you come to church, you recall what the Star of David does for us. Points us to Christ. Just as it did in His birth. But look at what the Star of David is pointing us to today. Once again, to Christ. But the Christ on the altar. Once again, in flesh and blood, no different than when He was born. He is with us today. And so, in our text in particular, we see the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem. And listen to what they say. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. We're shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the past. Hosanna literally means save us now. They were lifting up their souls and, to their, vo and, and, their, and, and their voices to Christ who was riding on the beast of burden. Save us now. You should be saying that as well. Save us now. Save us now. And Christ extended his arms and died. You desire to be saved? It takes the letting of blood. You desire to be saved? It takes Christ dying. So lift up your souls. Even if you're lifting it up saying, God, take this from me. Or God, save me now. God, forgive my sins. God, wash me clean. God, feed me your body and your blood. Lift up your souls. Ad te lavave. I lift my soul unto the Lord. And He hears you. When we lift our souls up to the Lord, He hears us. He forgives us. He cleanses us. And He feeds us. As we begin this new year in Advent, with Advent, let us remember, every single time that we come in here, here is a stable. And here is the altar. And because... He had to be on the altar. He was born in a stable. And that you find great Christ had to become so that he could be nailed to the cross. holes and wounds still open and says, Behold, you have lifted up your souls and I have answered. And I answered with my own blood. You are forgiven. Go in peace. Amen. I have been reading a book for a while now. It's one of it's one of that you can pick it up and read and put it down and go do and go do other things and then come back and you can and you can and you can pick it up again and you know exactly where you are uh, in the story. So I am currently on page like. 
30 maybe, maybe 30. But there's one thing that keeps going on in my mind that, that happened in the book and, he, and it made such good sense to me that it was perfect for this text. What happens in the book, and it, remember, it is, this is a fictional novel. This is not a theological tome. This is, my, this is my way of taking a brain break from theological tomes is to read novels instead of watch the news. In the book, there is a boy who is a complete genius. They call him global rather than uh, singular. And what that means is that many children who are geniuses usually are genius geniuses in a single way. People with Asperger's, for example, will, will have one or two things that are that they are very good at, be it reading, be it remembering, having an eidetic memory, playing music, something that is, it is not, not only are they good about, good, good at it, but they have a passion for it. Well, this kid, they called, instead of singular, they called global because he was good at everything and that he could talk or excuse me he, he could he could uh, think and speak and uh, would constantly be hungry for knowledge at 12 years old he was accepted in, in MIT and Emerson which is right across uh, the river I believe is that right M MIT No, I'm sorry, I'm being in the Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, the, the MIT and, and Emerson. And he was going there at the, at, to both at the same time, or he would be. Well, the way that, that, that he came about that is that he was going to a special school for gifted youngsters that was not in a Marvel comic. It was just, it was for children who were singular. Children who excelled at one or two things, but their reading level might be where it should be. And their, uh, and their musical ability is way above. Well, the principal calls in this young boy's parents and tells them that he's global. That he's able to understand everything but he's humble and he keeps to himself and the way that they tested him is that they brought in the hardest professor at the school 12 year old kid and he said I know how to test him I will teach him of the uh, I, I will quiz him on the poetic prose of the Baltic nation dating back to uh, the time of parchment. So, no pressure, right? It should be, it should be a, it should be a, 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 one of those things where you go, I have no idea, you're going to teach me. Well, the kid started answering the first question and then lectured for two hours to the professor on poetic prose, poetic prose, of the Baltic in the time of parchment and so, until the professor had to finally say all right stop I give up you win and so he takes him to the principal and he says you are right there's there's very little that this kid doesn't know and the reason I tell you that is because it's been in my head that that's exactly what Jesus did in our text. He comes into Nazareth where he was brought up and he goes and he sits in his hometown. He goes and he sits. Everyone sits. And then he stands and they bring him, notice this part, 
they bring him the scroll. Right? He didn't say, give me that one. They brought him the scroll. And he opened the scroll and he found the place where it read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He was teaching, he was saying this to rabbis, people much higher in the uh, hierarchy of rabbonic literature. And there he was reading this to them. And then he says one of the things that would ultimately get him crucified. Today, this scripture, that which I just read, has been fulfilled in your hearing. And the way that that is phrased, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I think that we can sometimes hear that text and think that he's speaking figuratively. But he's not. He's literally saying, as, you, as I am speaking these words and as you are hearing these words, this scripture is being fulfilled right here, right now. In other words... He's saying, I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. This book is about me. And he was to be crucified. The favor of the Lord would be that you would have your sins forgiven. Completely and totally wiped out. Talk about global. Objective justification. All the world forgiven by Jesus Christ himself on the cross. That's the favor of the Lord. The favor of the Lord is upon you. And so Christ wasn't simply a very, 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 very smart man. He was God in flesh. And if anyone ever asks, and because people do ask this question, did Jesus ever actually say that he was God? Yes. Right there. We just read it. The Messiah come to die, come to live. All for you. I wish I could tell you what happened to the, to the little boy in the story, but I'm only on page 30. <laughs> but so far, it's good. But I do know the end of the story for you and for the Messiah who stood before those who were older and supposedly wiser than him and said, I am the Christ. I am the Son of the living God. I will die so that you can live. The end of that story began at your baptism and will end when we're buried. But then it won't end. The end of that story is that Christ will come to judge the living and the dead. But that's not the end of the story. Then there's everlasting life. The story that never ends. Or to put it in terms of my youth, it's the never ending story. Amen. And now may the peace which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus now and forever. Amen. Amen.